Hello and welcome to Monkey Knife Fight Live, folks. I'm Connor Rountree, and today we're back with AJ Shulo from AJ MMA Betting. AJ, how are you? And welcome back to the show. Great to be here, Connor. Uh, good. Thanks for having me again. It's always a pleasure to chop it up with you. Great card, tough finale, fun card. Looking forward from it, top to bottom, prelims. Two winners will be crowned, and uh, yeah, plenty of opportunities for us to play Monkey Knife Fight as well. Yeah, well, getting into the main event of the card, you got Giga Shikadze versus Edson Barboza. Wow, a striker's paradise, AJ. I'm so excited for this fight just from that striking perspective and the fact that we've seen Shikadze really dominate inferior opponents through his UFC run thus far, which has been incredible. Obviously, he lost his first fight via uh, submission, but undefeated in the UFC since. And then Edson Barbosa has kind of reinvented himself since coming down to 145. And he's looked really sharp. Obviously, that Shane Burgos, his chin was tested in that fight. Took the punches, took the shots, and outpointed and outstruck him. AJ, how do you see this fight going on Saturday night, the main event? Yeah, uh, you know, Barbosa's run as of late kind of reminds me of Jose Aldo's. You know, he moves down a weight class after not being a small guy for the weight class he was initially with. And then he has all the success. And albeit, you know, he lost to Danny Ige. That was a fight a lot of people thought he won. And then he's lost a couple split decisions. Uh, Paul Felder, Danny... Um, Ige as well as mentioned but yeah he's been on a great run Makwan Americani Shane Burgos those are good wins uh and you mentioned Jakadze ever since joining the UFC after having some questionable uh, defensive grappling uh, that he showed you know with Santa's contender series fight and even his debut has really reinvented himself I think that the, the work to King's MMA with the likes of Benil Dariush Marvin Vittori and Calvin Gassam has really upgraded his defensive grappling it shouldn't be taking place on the ground here uh, both guys are, are good there. Barboza, a brown belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, 78% takedown defense, and both guys excel as kickboxers. So um, in the kickboxing battle, I think it's very good. I mean, very close. Uh, both guys are excellent technically, uh, very defensively sound with their with their range management. However, the difference maker I see going in favor of Barboza is I do think he pushes the higher tempo. I trust his cardio just a tad bit more. He's also the more proven fighter, meaning that he's fought and beat the better competition in my eyes. And I know we think of Barboza as a kicker mainly. However, he's actually a better boxer, in my opinion. I think he's got sharper hands, and I think he's got better pocket defense. And so I agree with the line being competitive, but I have to edge Barboza here. Of course, Shikadze has the durability advantage. He's a fighter more likely to make improvements on a fight-to-fight basis based on where he's at in his career. Uh, so I don't think this is a squash match by any means. But if you're asking me for a prediction, I do think that Edson Jr. Barboza gets it done here, probably in a decision scenario, because even though he hits hard, Shikadze is really tough. Yeah, I, I'm I'm completely with you there on every uh, every stance. I have it going long, and I have Edson Barbosa as well. But looking at it from a monkey knife fight perspective, with that in mind, and with the what we just said, five round fight going long, kickboxing matchup, Giga Shikadze, um, he lands just over three significant strikes per minute, and then Edson Barbosa comes in landing over four. Um, you know, both guys, I've seen them both get hit, and they both average over 11 minutes of octagon time per fight anyway. So even if one of them gets clipped, it would be after the two-minute mark when that cardio starts to get tested. So I'm going to take more and more on both these guys' uh, strike lines. Obviously, 119 and a half strikes, 120 strikes is a bit of a polarizing number for Edson Barbosa. But if anyone can do it, it's Edson Barbosa. Like, the leg kicks will come into play. I'm just really excited for this fight from a striking standpoint, but I'm completely with you. And then uh, just one thing I'd need to counter you on there uh, with the Paul Felder fight with Barboza. I know he, that he did take that as a loss, but on my card, he actually won that fight. It was a split decision, but I had him winning. I just, I have to get that out there because that was one of those ones where it's like, that was a blatant robbery in my eyes. And I think I had Barbosa. I think he, he outstruck him, I think, 64 to 52. I was just looking at it and had the takedown as well. So I think he had some uh, ground time. But yeah, so AJ, how do you see this one coming in on Monkey Knife Fight? Yeah, um, slight disagreement here. I actually think that while Barbosa does fight at the higher pace, and we do agree that this fight will go long, uh, I don't think we're going to have to worry about any non-significant strikes here because this fight shouldn't be taking place in the clinch or on the ground, which is how we typically see those non-significant strikes pile up mainly contested on the feet at distance where I just, I think Chikadze has good defense. He has very good range management in general. I don't like his pocket defense, but he does a very good job of sticking to the outside and looking at the stats here. He has 60% striking defense 
and absorbs only 2.67 significant strikes per minute. And I know the counter to that is, well, he hasn't fought anybody nearly as good as Barboza as a kickboxer and, you know, not nearly the pace. The point still stands that I think Jakadze is still defensively sound. Um, I think that while Junior could go under that 19 or 119 and a half, that is my lean that he goes under. And despite this fight going long, I actually think that Jakadze goes slightly over uh, the 66 and a half because um, while Junior does uh, encourage a high paced fight, he, that Coming along with that point, he does get hit a lot, uh, absorbing 4.15 significant strikes per minute. Of course, it's been pointed out that Chikadze does slow down as the fight progresses. Uh, but even, you know, Dan Hooker in, in less than a three-round fight was able to get off on north of 80 significant strikes on Barboza here. I'm looking at 81 back um, in 2018 here. And then uh, Shane Burgos, the last fight, uh, landed 80 significant strikes. And again, those guys are a bit more higher tempo than Chikadze in general, but uh, with Barboza fatiguing as the fight goes on, uh, maybe the body work of, of Chikadze and Barboza slow each other down, making each other more hittable. I think that we could see here Chikadze go over that threshold and then Barboza go under. Uh, I see. I think I'm completely with you on Chikadze. I think you you nailed it. Um, I think Barboza is very hittable. Uh, Shane Burgos proved that. And we just saw Barboza land 98 significant strikes against Shane Burgos, uh, you know, in the third round. And that was stopped uh, less than two minutes into the third round. So, um, I do agree that Shikadze isn't hittable, but to start, he's very good at keeping to the outside. But as he gets tired, I think Bar Bar Barbosa is going to be able to close that distance. And that's when the strikes are going to pile up. And you're going to see a lot more significant strikes and more strikes in the rounds three, four, and five of the fight than we'll see in round one and two. I think Shikadze will be able to keep up that defense, but I think those numbers are going to pile on late. And that's why I'm sticking with them more. But uh, yeah, you know, we're, we're kind of counter, but completely agree with Giga Shikadze. And we agree on the outcome of the fight. So that's always fun. Uh, Jason, so we're going to go. Uh, uh, we're splitting. AJ and I are splitting on Edson Barbosa. I like the more. AJ likes the less. And then Giga Shikadze, we both like the more on. Although we like Barbosa to win the fight. Folks, you can do your own research. You can uh, either go with me, go with AJ, scroll down, hit submit and you're in to win on your buy-in. Up next, folks, we're going to move over a weight class, or up a weight class, actually, up a couple weight classes. It's Rodriguez versus Lee. Kevin Lee, one of the more polarizing figures in the sport. Always fun to watch him fight. Uh, was kind of bummed out when he was pulled off the card a couple of weeks ago. He's back to make this card a lot more fun for us. AJ, how do you see this fight playing out, and what do you think on Monkey Knight Fight? Yeah, me and Jason have to be the two most excited people uh, to see Kevin Lee fight amongst other people. Um, he's just, you know, there, there's Connor, there's Colby, there's a couple other guys in there that are just so polarizing. And then, of course, there's Kevin Lee, who, uh, of course, you don't see many physical altercations at press conferences these days, especially in the past few years. But Kevin Lee and Michael Chiesa, they went to war at a presser. Uh, you know, what was, was one shot one. there? It was indeed. Uh, your, your mama jokes were, were thrown out. It, it shows how, how it could escalate. Um, but anyway, it, it's nice to see Lee back. Obviously, there's some questions here with some injuries he's dealt with. He's coming in here at a layoff. However, um, I think that welterweight is an appropriate weight class for him. He's not going to be the biggest guy in this weight class, but we know historically he struggled on the scales at, at lightweight, 155 pounds. He's just such a big, strong guy. And when I look at him in this fight stylistically, I think it's a pretty good fight for Lee. I mean, Rodriguez, we don't know a ton about his takedown defense, but going back to the Tim Means fight, he was taken down easily there. He was taken down easily by Mike Perry. Didn't really know how to scramble off of his back. Technically the first time Perry took him down, he controlled him for about a minute 30 till the round sealed off there. And then in the second round, Rodriguez scrambled to his back. However, he gave up his back to do so. And Kevin Lee loves to take the back. He will just sink mm -hmm. in the hooks, get the rear naked choke, even against high level submission grapplers. I mean, he submitted Michael Kiesa. He submitted Mike, uh, yeah. Francisco Trinaldo, right? So the way I see this fight going down, honestly, it might be a hot take is, I think Lee gets a quick takedown here, takes the back, and gets a, a rear naked choke in round one. I think we see both guys hit their under threshold. I know historically Rodriguez fights at a crazy high tempo, and, and if this fight takes place on the feet, I think it could get there. However, I just don't see it taking place on the feet for 15 minutes. And then um, on the flip side, you know, Rodriguez is going to be taller than Lee. However, Lee's actually got a little bit of a reach mm -hmm. advantage on him here too, which, which Rodriguez isn't used to. And I think that Lee's actually a better striker in the two from a technical point of view. Rodriguez is more durable and has a higher output, but I think Lee's better defense, better technique should help, uh, should help him win the aggregate of the exchanges there. So I'm going to actually go under on both of these guys here. I think we just see Kevin Lee go out, get a quick finish. Uh, this is actually a step down in competition with all due respect to Rodriguez. Kevin Lee's just been, you know, facing the, the now champion, Charles Oliveira. You know, he, he had a very competitive or a very good fight with uh, Dos Anjos until he gassed. 
uh, you know, Gregor Gillespie. I mean, he just fought the who's who at lightweight. Fought Edson he Barboza. He did, yeah, demolished Edson Barboza. So Lee Lee has been there and done that against the highest level of competition. And uh, I think this is just a, a bit too big of a step up for Rodriguez. I think we see Lee here get the back and get the rear naked choke. Wow, yeah. I think, um, yeah, obviously when you go for the first round submission finish, that's obviously a hot take because there's so many things that could happen, right? The first round knockout could happen on the feet, but the first round submission is always a bold take. Uh, analysts do respect that. So AJ, I will tip my cap to you on that call there. But um, the way I see this fight going is exactly that. I think Kevin Lee knows he has the wrestling advantage. I think he's going to take him down, and I think he's going to beat him up, actually. And I do have to say that fights do start on the feet, and Daniel Rodriguez does push the pressure, obviously landing over eight significant strikes per minute. And I think Kevin Lee, you know, he likes to strike. We saw what he did to Gregor Gillespie. Uh, that beautiful combination, the jab followed up by the head kick that sent him flying. Jason, you probably pulled that one up on Twitter. That's a fun one to watch. But um, he just absolutely broke his face. I think he might be willing to engage on the feet because I think he could have an advantage technically in striking. I, Kevin Lee is a good striker, and I think he might want to – it's been a while since he's been in there. I think – Which video, you know, Connor? Sorry, I missed it before. The Kevin Lee, uh, Gregor Gillespie knockout. It's just so vicious. Yeah, our, our producer in the background, I don't know if his mic is on, just saying he's there laughing about it. Yeah, it's pretty vicious, folks. But EJ, I just, something tells me that Kevin Lee's going to want to try to strike and then resort to wrestling because I think he thinks he's going to have a striking advantage, which makes me just kind of draw this fight out a little longer. Um, which makes me just want to take the more and the more on that. But I see... Exactly. My, my route to his path to victory is taking him down, getting the submission or getting the ground and pound. Obviously that 77 inch reach, those help when you're getting in those hooks from the back and you lock it in the neck. Right. So I'm completely with you on there, but I think just Kevin Lee might want to strike. Like you look at that beautiful combination. He landed on Gillespie. Um, obviously striking with Daniel Rodriguez, you're playing with fire a little bit, but I don't know. I just, I kind of have to go against you again there, AJ, and go with the more and the more on that one, just because I think Kevin Lee is going to want to get in there and he's going to want to just, I think he's going to want to strike. AJ is going less and less. I'm going more and more folks. We're having some fun today on MKF. It's tough. Hey, it's, it's, it's a wild week. What can we say? Folks, getting into tough, go hit and hit submit, by the way. Don't forget to hit submit. Thank you, Jason. Um, getting into tough now, folks. If you weren't aware, it is the tough finale this weekend. Coach Brian Ortega and Coach uh, Volkanovsky. These guys have been going at it back and forth, the fake talk. It was pretty funny. I tuned into a couple episodes to check in on these guys and see how they were and just kind of take my notes. And Brian Battle, man, did is he ever good at staying to the outside one thing I did notice, though, his takedown defense was solid, but once he got taken down, he was – he. His internet's oh, no. always pretty good, and then at always randomly, like, exactly 15 minutes in, our wonderful host, um, I, I think he was going on over there a little bit about Brian Battle and, uh, and the tough season. We'll give it a second. Um, to see what he comes back with. Until then, this is the... Uh, I should put on some, like, uh, elevator hold music uh, during this section of the of the Twitch stream where we can talk. This is the... It's your free platform to say whatever you want, AJ. <laughs> Please hold while we take a few second break for technical <laughs> difficulties here. Mr. Roundtree will be back to the stream in a matter of moments. <laughs> um, yeah. Have you been watching well, Tough I this year, by the way, or...? I have. I I was one of the few oh, people that actually. Okay. I'm just, I'm just gonna. No, I'm just gonna get the starting soon. Coming back. You're good. We're good. We can keep going. I'll just put it on mute and we'll be. Zoom just crashed on me. Yeah, did did mm -hmm. did my um, breakdown on Brian Battle come through or no? Okay, well, 
Brian Battle, basically great at, great striker, great at keeping to the outside. Seems to have a decent gas tank on him from what I saw on Tough. Uh, the one thing was he had great takedown defense, but when he was taken down, he looked like a fish out of water on his back. That was my one take. AJ, how do you see this fight playing out on Monkey Knife Fight? What do you take? What do you see from these tough competitors? Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, I put out uh, a little sneak peek, if you will, for the premium article that I did. Um, I did uh, write in my the opening uh, statement for this breakdown was that just because the winner of this fight is crowned the champion of the show doesn't necessarily mean that the best middleweight. And what I mean by that is mm-hmm. Trayshawn Gore was supposed to be competing here in this finale. However, he got injured. He actually knocked out Gilbert Urbina in a semifinal round. However, uh, due to Gore withdrawing, Urbina was the next guy to step in. So I am a firm believer that Gore was the best uh, middleweight on the show. Um, I think he's a very good boxer, but that's a story for another time. Um, Urbina, he excels as a submission grappler. I just don't trust him in general to win fights on the feet. He just, like we said, he got knocked out. He doesn't have good defense. He just doesn't set up his entries when entering the pocket, head completely on the center line, and that's how he got knocked out. Um, And so he needs to get fights to the ground. But the problem with that is I've seen him struggle uh, defending takedowns, giving up his back. I've seen him take a lot of backs, but it's it's worked in reverse as well. Um, He took the back of Michael Gilmore in the preliminary round, uh, a a late, the the late notice replacement guy on the show stepping in for Miles Hunsinger, and and he choked him out after taking his back right away. Like, That'll work against uh, opposition that doesn't know how to grapple. And, and I mean, yeah, like battle isn't the best offensive grappler. As you said, Petrovsky took him down uh, a few times. He mounted him at one point. But to me, Petrovsky is just a much better wrestler than Urbina. I think he's a better athlete as well. Um, battle, like you said, his mobility on the outside, his lateral footwork, in theory, means that Urbina will have a tougher time tracking him down. He's just such a long rangey guy and it's just constantly pumping out offense. Not, not a lot of combinations, but more so like one off, mm-hmm. one off kicks and straight punches and things yeah, like not, that. He not a lot like- of power behind them either. Just he, he lands. It's just a constant rate. It seems that he's just, he's, he's touching his opponents up. Exactly. Yeah. And that, that won't get knockouts at a high rate, but it, it wins rounds. Right. And mm-hmm. so that's why I kind of like the over on both guys here. I do think that while it's possible battle knocks Urbina out, um, I don't think he's a huge power puncher, not, not in the level of gore. Um, and then I just think we see this fight play out. The odds suggest it could, you know, play out uh, for extended periods of time where um, in theory, either guy could get a finish, but Urbina could land some volume as, of his own. His work rate is, is rather okay. I'd say not a great striker, but I would trust uh, both guys to take each other's best shots. Of course, Urbina in theory could take battles back. It's a possibility, but I lean that this fight takes place on the feet for the most part. And uh, I think we actually see Brian Daniel here get uh, crowned the uh, tough middleweight winner. Yeah, I'm completely with you on the prediction as well. I have more and more for the exact same reason, because one thing I really wanted to note in Brian Battle's first uh, tough attempt, when I was watching the fight, I had seven takedown attempts and only one land. I don't know what the official number was, but my number was, okay, th- that was a takedown attempt seven times, and he defended six of them. And he was up against the cage. He was able to spin the clinch and land a couple strikes, disengage and get on his bike and stay to the outside. So I think that's exactly what we're going to see in this fight. And another thing, it's not tough, right? Urbina, he chases that takedown. He looked like he, he gets tired towards the second round in, in tough inside the octagon. This is a sanctioned UFC fight. This is going to be three rounds. So I think Brian Battle is going to be able to land as it goes longer. And I think Urbina is going to land too. Because as you said, and as I said before, Brian Battle lands, but it, there isn't a lot of power behind it unless it's the kicks. His punches don't have a lot of power, but his kicks do. His He had a couple of solid head kicks on the show uh, that I saw, obviously. So, um, yeah, I'm completely with you, AJ. I like the more and more. And I think Brian Battle uh, gets gets crowned the champion here on, on Tough as well. So, uh, where is our guy Jason here? If we could go more and more, boom, boom. AJ and I both like the more and the more, and we'll scroll down and we'll hit Submit. Wish we could have pictures of these guys. <laughs> well, they're just they're they're new. They're from Tuff. Just imagine, you know? just, just imagine they're there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm gonna put a photo of Brian AJ. Battle's got a. Got I'm gonna put a photo of AJ him. and a photo of Connor right here. Uh, <laughs> yeah, put put me over Brian Battle, please. Yeah. <laughs> please. Uh, are we, we're <laughs> doing the other tough. Oh, we have a, we have one of the tough fighters here too. Yeah, we have. Oh, we do have a tough. Uh, there's actually two other tough fights on the card too. Um, just cool fun fact. There's this one and another one. Anyway, so the bantamweight final. AJ, how do you see this one playing out? We're just going to throw it to you right off the top. 
So fun fact, I think why we see a picture for Ricky Tercios here is because he actually competed on Dana White's Contender Series against Boston Salmon uh, a couple of years ago. That's my guess. Can't confirm nor deny, but that's my best guess. Isn't that wild? It was so long ago, uh, but it felt like it was just yesterday. Um, and ironically, in that fight, Tercios landed over 100 significant strikes to Salmon 61, yet he still lost a unanimous decision. So it's all very crazy. I think volume is important. Uh, obviously, when you see differentials like that you see the guy with the bigger differential win but for whatever reason it was an outlier um anyway getting into the fight uh brady high stand is a a sick jiu-jitsu fighter uh he, he's close friends with michael chiesa uh, a brown belt in jiu-jitsu and what i like about his game is he's like one of these relentless wrestler type of guys i mean yeah he slows down he could get beaten up on the feet but he is just relentless when it comes to pursuing the takedowns he'll just go for it for all 15 minutes and he picked up a pretty solid win on the show in my opinion against josh reddinghouse a guy that's 16 and 5 professionally that has fought guys like marlon mm -hmm. marais and sergey marazov twice um that's a that's a good feather in his cap he's only 22 years old he's very green at this point but i like his style that he presents in general um and that optically should mean that he's only going to get better as this uh, as time kind of goes on here tercios a, a well-rounded guy uh grows back and forth between uh gracie baja uh the woodlands and uh, team alpha male a brown belt in jiu-jitsu is tercios but um he just doesn't have good wrestling so he mainly wants to just keep fights upright not the most dangerous guy on the feet but he does have uh he kind of reminds me of marlon vera in a way just very attritional based um volume just will come at you doesn't give up uh he probably has a bit better cardio than high stand however um i do think that high stands wrestling should be a difference maker here i think he could control where the fight goes and it's just a matter of uh if and when he gasses and if tercios could take over um i don't think tercios is a straight up bad scrambler but again the takedown defense and, and high stands very good at taking the back i think he could hold position there i'm actually going to go over on both guys i do think that while these two might not stand for 15 minutes we could see a lot of grappling exchanges and the clinching on the ground where they just kind of pitter patter each other with some strikes here um as we talked about tercios generally fights at a high pace high stand as well uh, more so with his wrestling but I, he does land some ground and pound he got a ground and pound stoppage that semifinals fight against uh vince murdoch there injury in there but still a, an impressive finish nonetheless um so yeah i'm gonna go over and over here i think we see this fight play out for three rounds and actually i'm gonna go with the underdog here in brady high stand to get the upset wow oh yeah you just you just broke that down to a point where i can't really argue with brady high stand now huh all right well i'm rolling with it too I just see if Brady takes something. <laughs> I just, I had the more and the more because I just, I saw Brady chasing the takedown, not really being able to get it and going down and taking it again. And if he does get it, he's just going to land a bunch on top. So I had the more and more as well, but now, um, wow, I might be putting a little side bet there. Thanks, AJ. Uh, thanks for that one. All right, everyone. You heard that. That was AJ at his finest going off folks. The more and the more head down, hit submit, maybe do a 50 on that one. AJ sounded pretty confident. I don't know. Um, and hit submit and you're in to win one last tough fight on the card that I want to touch on is Michael Gilmore versus Andre uh, Petrosky, because I think Andre Petrosky's the probably the second best middleweight that I saw on the show behind Gore. I was really impressed with his wrestling abilities. And this is a fight that I see. Uh, both of the strikers going for more and more. I think that it's just going to be a battle. I think it's going to be fun to watch. And I think Andre is going to probably try to take some, take him down, get some ground and pound in. And when I saw him on tough, I was just, I was so, I was impressed. I, you know, he's got 97 D1 wins as a wrestler. Um, he landed some big shots and he got the submission finish from the top in the first round. Just, I was in his uh, first fight on tough, obviously. So I was really, really excited when I saw that. AJ, how do you see this fight going? I think it sets up nicely for Petrovsky to go out here, get a quick takedown, take Gilmore's back, and probably get a choke. Um, the thing, though, right, is... So less and less. <laughs> yeah, less and less is, is going to be my prediction there. However, I do have concerns about him just kind of in general, maybe not in this fight, but he is a great wrestler. He's a strong grappler, but he's got about four minutes of cardio, and that's always mm -hmm. going to be a concern I have with any fighter, regardless of how dangerous they are in the first round, because... If you extend them, they could just fatigue and then their technical acumen just kind of gets thrown out the window because your, your muscles just fill up with oxygen. You're just not fighting as good as you would if you were full of gas. And again, Gilmore submitted on the show. He's been submitted plenty of times on the regional scene. I've seen him get his back taken a bunch, but so that's not a, a, a threat. I think Petrovsky has in general. However, uh, when we're talking about such a, a wide line here, uh, that is a concern I have for a guy like Petrovsky, who if this fight 
if if I'm holding a Petrovsky ticket and this fight goes beyond the first round, I am sweating because especially because mm-hmm. Gilmore's not a bad striker. Um, I favor him on the feet actually of the two. Um, and that has been the culprit to Petrovsky's losses. He was submitted by battle, not because he was the worst fighter, as you pointed out, but because he got tired and he got choked out. Um, and even against Aaron Jeffrey, Aaron Jeffrey's a good guy. He's fought guys like Brendan Allen and other UFC level talents, but uh, Petrovsky, after having a, a good first round, slowed down, and then Jeffrey was able to finish him late there or about halfway through the second round. So, uh, again, I don't want to sway away from the fact that I, I do like the under on both guys. However, uh, I'm, I'm sort of being a little bit more cautious than maybe the betting odds suggest uh, when it comes to Petrovsky from the long term point of view. Aaron Jeffrey, remember when we were talking on the show about that Canadian guy that uh, trained at the same gym that I trained at for a little bit? That's him. Yeah, that's Aaron Jeffrey. Trains with Elias Theodoro and um, my buddy Tom Theokaris. So we'll try to get uh, we'll try to get Aaron on the show. He's got a he's got a contender series fight coming up in a few months. So we'll try to get him on the show before that. We're going less and less. Um, you know, I, I I just I saw it being a, br- a bit of a brawl too, um, but yeah, less and less seems pretty confident. Uh, I'm with AJ there. I, I think Petrovsky's going to get the win uh, based off what I saw on the show. I just think he's the more well-rounded fighter. And yeah, if it goes down, as I said, 97 wins, nice. Division One wrestler. Let's uh, get into have, the KO uh, Kings. About five minutes remaining here, so KO Kings. Oh, you just said it. Never mind. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll shut up now. Bye. All right, our producer Jason is just in our ears having some fun in the background. But into the Knockout Kings contest, I think one KO King pick that everybody will have is Makamed Muradov. Obviously, back-to-back performance of the night bonuses. And he's taking on Mershart, who has been knocked out inside 90 seconds in two out of his last three fights. AJ, do you agree with that one? Absolutely. You're right on the money with that take. I think it sets up nicely for Muradov to get another knockout. Mirshard is super hittable when standing, uh, doesn't have the best durability. And and Muradov is is a great striker with very sharp technique. So I think it sets up nicely for him to go out there and get a, a, not only, he can not only get a first round knockout, but he has two third round knockouts in the UFC. So I like the the wide array of Mm -hmm. of outcomes in which Muradov could get a knockout in this matchup. So I like him. Yeah, speaking to the point beforehand of what we were just talking about in the previous matchup to the cardio, the fact that he can keep going and push that knockout power and keep that power in his hands in the third round is huge. AJ, who is your next pick? Another obvious one, but... You know, can't steer away from it. Mata Martinez here going against Guido Canetti. Look, Canetti's a guy that's 41 years of age coming off a knockout loss, and uh, he's been hurt in plenty of fights in the past. You know, when he loses, he typically gets finished. And uh, Martinez, that's his MO. All of his wins are by knockout. You know, he hasn't actually won a fight that has gone past the second round. All of his wins are by first or second round knockout. And so I have concerns about Martinez in general. I don't think he has good takedown defense. I don't think he has good grappling on the mat, but this should set up nicely for him to get a, a knockout here as a more youthful guy, the more durable guy with uh, probably sharper technique at this point. So I do think Martinez goes out here and gets a quick knockout. And the third and final pick, Mr. Shulo, who do you like? I'm actually going to go with the underdog here. I'm feeling a little frisky because Sam Alvey, Ooh is on a six fight losing streak, but stylistically it's a fight. I think he could win. I mean, look, I always have questions. Smiling about Sam Elvey. He's, he needs that win, man. He's got that smiley face uh, shaved in the back of his head. Yeah, I expect him to be no more Mr. Nice guy going into this fight. Cause he needs the win, man. And uh, he's got power as we know. And, and Terman, he's coming off back-to-back knockout losses. And, you know, Silva is a guy that hits pretty hard, but you know, getting knocked out from ground and pound just two months ago is a big concern. You usually see guys that are knocked out, take anywhere from six months to a year off. And then before that, he was knocked out by Andrew Sanchez, who's not historically a big puncher. So uh, while Alvi has issues with output and uh, just very low tempoed in general, I do think it sets up pretty nicely for him to get a knockout if he does win. So I'm going to, you know, take a little bit of a stand here, go with Sam Alvi, smiling Sam. I like that. Uh, My third pick, I'm actually going to take Kevin Lee. Uh, We talked about it last week uh, because taking the back, it could go either way once he gets on top. But I really do think Kevin Lee's been laid off. He's a competitive guy. He's a polarizing figure that we talked about, and he likes to strike. We know he has the KO power. Let's see if Rodriguez can eat those heavier shots from a guy that's fought those upper echelon opponents. So I'm going to go with Kevin Lee. Uh, and those are my three as well. I think, man, is a great pick. Martinez is obviously. I think though, I think um, Makamed and uh, Martinez were pretty obvious picks off the bat. So I'm glad we we both agreed with those two off the bat. And then just Kevin Lee, I just I just think he's going to be able to get the takedowns, AJ. And when, when he's on top, just boom, 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 boom. If that makes any sense at all. 
I don't know. That's, Folks, thanks yeah. for tuning in to Monkey Knife Fight Live this week. Obviously, AJ Shulo. Make sure you give him a follow on Twitter at AJMMA Betting and check out AJMMABetting.com for his whole list of picks. Those are our Monkey Knife Fight picks of the day, obviously. I'm Connor Roundtree. That's AJ Shulo. Remember to hit it hard.